Hello. Hi, good morning, everyone. Yes, sir. We will start with an introduction, sir. Definitely. Yeah, yes. Good morning and a hearty welcome to everyone attending this virtual workshop. The speaker who will be presenting in this session is an energetic and an inspiring person. He works as a community manager at Autodesk, where he spreads the good news about how Fusion 360, a revolutionary product from Autodesk, democratizes design and manufacturing by empowering people to integrate their disconnected product development process. He opens the line of interaction between this, their disconnected product development process. He also connects customers, businesses, and partners to get projects completed. With over eight years in the industry, he has experience in program management, market development, strategic implementation, and company collaboration. In other words, he excites people about transformational innovation and inspires them to innovate in the way they do things. Autodesk's Fusion 360 Academy is a great example of what he has achieved over the years and one I was fortunate enough to be a part of. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Varun Heta. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I want to thank VIT for uh, inviting me to this international conference, a virtual conference. And it's a true honor for me to present alongside our prestigious delegates today. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you everyone for joining this session. I'll quickly share my presentation. Uh, please let me know if this is visible. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Yes. Visible, visible, visible. Yes. Awesome. I will switch off my video so that my small little dialog box doesn't pop up in the presentation. All right, uh, uh, I, I believe this part has already been completed. Uh, I'll just give a quick walkthrough. Uh, my name is Varun Heta and uh, working at Autodesk and I'm responsible for nurturing Fusion ecosystem and make sure our customers innovate in their design and manufacturing workflows. And I also support our customers become comfortable over, with our latest and newest product updates. And that's one of the large shot of what we did uh, back in February. It, does, it has become a great uh, design and manufacturing family where people support each other and a lot of peer learning happens. At Autodesk, we make software tools to help people with design challenges every day. That's all we do at Autodesk. We help our customers who design and make everything from skyscrapers to smart cars, from bridges to blockbusters. We help our customers who make buildings and cars with less environmental impact and movies with more emotional impact. Our tools automate how things are designed in the digital world and made in the physical world. We help architects simulate how the buildings they design will perform before they are built. And we help site workers construct them so they continue to perform after they are built. We help mechanical engineers simulate the performance of cars before they are made. And we also help manufacturing engineers prepare those cars to perform once they are made. And you know, we, all, we even help some of our customers make movies that perform in the, at the box office our tools automate the way our customers design and make things. In fact, we have been in the automation business for over 35 years. It's, it's actually true that our technology has disrupted and changed many jobs. And automation, we keep on hearing about automation, is no doubt changing how we work, but more importantly, it's also changing what we work on. And here I want to give an example. 
of innovation and ways to innovate. We talk about the future of making, which is here. And this is bringing radical changes in the way things are designed, made, and used. Let's consider some examples of innovation. Here's an example of something called incremental innovation. You know, manufacturers strive to continually innovate with the design of their products. This can be the typical light bulb idea that is a new product that has been never created before. Or the innovation can be in technology that changes a product's capabilities and providing a competitive edge against other organizations. Or even better, disrupt the market and create an entirely new category of product that is uniquely positioned to succeed. Let's take up these examples. There are three types of innovations which are, and they, they are all very important. So this drone is first example. Uh, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles, we keep seeing them in various applications these days. And uh, this is a truly an amazing story of growth. In 2011, a company called DJI, we have, many of us have This is an example you see here in the bottom left corner. Example of rethinking is the example of is one of the innovation, which is about the rethinking of the fundamental necessity and creating a brand new product. Born out of the need for providing families an affordable source of energy to charge mobile phones or even LED lights is called BioLite. This is a stove, which is the only cook stove in the world capable of, capable of generating electricity from its own waste heat while reducing toxic smoke emissions by 90%. This enables use in the off-grid areas where stoves are mostly needed. And the final example, the hype of this self-driving cars, you see, this is started three, four years ago. Actually, like now it's almost like four, five years ago. And at that time, it looked like a long shot. And today you see major car manufacturers they are going ahead with electric vehicles and also you know, looking forward for self-driving vehicles. And I think we all can expect to see some of this on, in the road in the next couple of years. Yeah, that's. Then we talk about productivity. Well, design companies and manufacturing companies, specifically manufacturing companies, they seek to increase productivity by addressing two sides of the our productivity equation. On the input side, the, our manufacturers can create, can increase overall productivity by lowering overhead cost. They tend to use affordable materials or you know, uh, affordable resources. On the output side, this can be achieved by implementing a portfolio of different investment initiatives to increase output and quality. Uh, some of the examples are manufacturers look for increasing automation. They, they also look for improving their processes and even in, in employing just-in-time lean manufacturing. These methods, while effective, do not often lead to a long-term differentiation. These could be categorized as an incremental changes and not transformational. Uh, transformation is mostly, mostly needed to outperform competitors in industry. Let's talk about process. Manufacturers also seek to innovate with entirely new methods and processes that can give, a, give them a competitive advantage. Here's the case. If you see all the cases, manufacturers find them constantly seeking new techniques, capabilities, and processes that will separate them from their competition. But these traditional success factors are about to change dramatically. Check this one. The first example in the top 
uh, right corner you see there's a robot arm and there's a fuselage of an airplane so you see this uh, carbon this uh, robot arm is layering this uh, carbon fiber sheet on an airbus fuselage definitely carbon fiber we all know we have heard about this many times reduces uh, weight increases uh, strength and all those things this definitely is going to help this aircraft reduce the weight at the same time reducing fuel fuel consumption what's most important thing here is airbus did not invent carbon fiber or the use of carbon fiber they are using this manufacturing technique as the transformative way to get ahead of the competition the second example depicts rapid prototyping most users many users i would say have access to desktop based 3d printing or open source diy based 3d printing which is some, which is called fdm fuse deposition modeling now standard we can say standard 3d printing is very commonly accepted however what is transformational in innovation is printing in metals and composites this is where designer and companies are competing against each other this is another example of a consumer product so a company called uh, under armor they designed world's first uh, 3d printed generatable design shoes uh, and it created a lot of fire in in market so 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 they used already software called generative design to create this lattice midsole for a stable heel structure with the approximate elements of cushioning the strength for training i mean this is complex this is this can create results which are high performing and which human designers could not uh, create in less amount of time when we talk about these innovations and processes and productivity there are certain barriers which are all existing and we all have experienced that that is you know and even some of you might agree to this we have limited time to ideate there are limits of what you do predict and evaluate even for the most experienced person that happens like that typically down process uh, downstream processes are not considered during the design phase and now this might not be true everywhere but applying downstream constraints typically does not impact innovation so we have something called generative design technology and this is a technology by autodesk and which is actually a design exploration technology we might have heard about something called topology optimization very known technology right and designers and engineers use that to create to optimize shapes whatever they create uh, for a certain pipe or certain uh, bracket or something what makes generative design interesting is the ability so let's take an example suppose we have to move from point a to point b and all i need i all i know was uh, there is a ship route what if i consult a professional or a, some 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 expert person and they suggest me that we can even consider taking another route which is 60% faster which is great which is amazing this is actually a great example of optimization now let's consider the same situation and what happens if we get to know that there are multiple routes that can take us from point a to point b other than ship routes it could be a truck route it could be a train it could be an airplane and i can do my educated trade off based on my requirements i can think of uh, if i have to save time i'll could definitely go with plane but definitely is going to create uh, increase my cost at the same time if i have to uh, you know think of affordability and all those things maybe ship could be my route or maybe i can also consider taking train so it allows a lot of opens new opportunities for people to uh, do the educated trade off so here's a quick example of how generative design helps the product development process usually what happens is 
when a new product has been is about to be ideated so we have to think of a lot of concept design and that starts from a very basic notepad and a sketch right so we start sketching and thinking about the possibilities and a lot of people come up with new iterations discussions and all these things are actually called concepts these concepts has a time to market for there's a time to market for these concepts and they this involve involves a lot of uh, processes a lot of steps so there's a gray area which is between concept designing to validation and that includes a lot of things evaluation manufacturability and all these things so a lot of back and forth happens when this uh, this thing is taking place a concept design is taking place so from iteration phase to design to production phase there is a lot of iteration and discussion that requires consumes a lot of bandwidth let's take the same example what if the 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 initial designs the concept design that we create are all validated all ready for manufacturing in that case we can reduce a significant amount of time and impact our productivity. So rather than doing, going forward with uh, back and flow, feedback sharing and all those things, we can choose one of that and make it ready for manufacturing. So technically we say there are multiple right outcomes for a design problem, and it could be anything. It could be a bracket, it could be a component, it could be a, maybe a frame of a drone. The image you see right here is actually a redesigned frame of DJI Phantom. Let's see how this technology is, uh, works in action. Here's the bike and its swing arm needs to be optimized. So the things that you see in orange are actually called preserved geometry. That means we don't want these uh, connectors to be modified. And the things that are in red right now are actually considered as obstacles. I put my forces and loading condition and inform my computer that do not modify anything, do not put anything in the red area and just connect my green zone. Computer actually gives us a lot of options. You know? It's like using artificial intelligence and some algorithms. So technically it's actually simulating with our loading conditions, manufacturing methods and all the parameters and taking out some outcomes that can suit our needs. So the way we were taking, uh, we were doing the trade off with the ship route, the train route and the aeroplane route. It's exactly the same thing. This time, we have to choose the part that suits our needs based on stiffness, strength, mass, cost, drag, uh, thermal conditions, and all those things. And later on, this can be taken for manufacturing. It could be additive, it could be CNC machine, it could be casting. So we get a lot of new opportunities with technologies like generative design. To create the final outcome. But what's more important here is to understand is it like just pressing an enter in your PC, in your keyboard, and asking the computer to design a product for me? Definitely not. It sounds amazing, but it has a workaround. And even if when we say automation, you'll understand it's definitely not going to take your job. Let's understand the expectations versus reality. Whenever I present this, whenever I share this presentation to my audience, they all expect, all right, uh, my work is sorted. I have to just do my 25% of my work and rest will be taken care of by computer and all those things. Let me tell you, this is wrong. Even in reality, we say these things help us, help human beings to be more productive and innovative. Same way with generative design, in, in reality, still 60 to 70, 70% of the work still has to be done by the engineer. And generative design adds on to our capabilities. It doesn't do our job, it adds on to our capabilities and make us more productive. So we can iterate with more design thinking and design iteration in less time. And later on, even after generative, we have to follow the traditional manufacturing processes. That is post-processing and even checking out things for simulation. We all follow that in our processes. Here's a quick example, just to help you understand in a very easy way. 
this is a bracket lift point bracket which is supposed to lift 600 pounds of weight it's almost like approximately 2000 newtons of force i think this is supposed to be manufactured in ss316 and the company wanted to modify this and think of the uh, and wanted to explore any other outcomes that can be lightweight and uh, that can also be machined using three axis cnc generator design workflow is actually define generate and explore it's that simple so first we define all the problems all the initial requirements then computer will generate and then we explore let's take in, let's quickly check in action this was our actual bracket and you see this workspace is actually of the software that does this job so this is the actual bracket so uh, what's interesting here is the designer or the engineer they have a workaround they have to do some redesign re-engineering on this part we have to inform our computer what are the parts that need not have to be modified that means i want to put this bracket on some other component assembly definitely i'm going to put my uh, bolts in this place right and there's going to be a rod that's going to the a pin that's going to go in this uh, uh, these these areas and then we have to create obstacle geometry that means we have to specify the areas where we don't want computer to make anything right things like that obviously i want the base below these green areas to be uh, flat i don't want anything below that because it has to be a part of a sub assembly so now we are literally asking computer can you can help us connect these green areas with the idle material in specific material with the way we want it to be manufactured can lift 600 pounds or 2000 newtons maintaining all the loading conditions pretty interesting so gray actual part is now gone and we allow a pc to think of creating something for something better for us so the way we do simulations we specify there were structural constraints here this will be the phases of, of this bracket and then we specify the loading conditions right it can be multiple loads it can be one load it can be you know multiple studies usually it's up to four loads that we do so in this example we are just considering one just to give a reference so it's easy to understand understand understood by everyone our objective is actually to minimize mass and our way of manufacturing method is uh, unrestricted which is actually in uh, which is actually casting that means no matter what they will not under identify anything uh, x y or orientation of the part or something like that when we select additive this opens up new opportunities there is something called overhang angle when we do 3d uh, work on additive manufacturing we have to make sure to reduce the support structure so we carefully observe what should be the overhang angle so our 3d printer doesn't make a lot of support structure support is structure is actually uh, wasting a lot of material definitely is going to hold the part in place but i'm not going to reuse support for any other purposes at the same time i can put my minimum thickness and all those things or even i can look for milling options if i am going to manufacture this on 2.5 axis 3 axis or 5 axis milling or even 2, two axis cutting then we specify our materials and later on uh, we preview the part how it's going to look like and this is it looks like a huge massive bulky block of metal which computer is the software is going to simulate and take out the extra material to make it ready for our uh, loading conditions so here comes the explore uh, phase where we have to take out the outcomes and based on our requirements we take up one of that here's the outcome and we take up the exam the outcome in the actual workspace okay so this was our actual bracket and this is a new bracket that we've done with generative both can do loading and all those things after this we have to simulate right so when it was simulated we, we noticed that the displacement in the actual bracket was 0 0.0083 mm and in the new one is almost very similar 0 0.0087 
and the stress handling capacity of the actual bracket was 18.23 and the new one was actually 157 point or 157 which is a significant increase and at the same time it was 79 percent lighter a lot of cost saving was a uh, weight reduction happened what's important here is to understand this right bracket is actually the outcome for additive manufacturing we have a technology called slm which is metal based 3d printing 3d printing you know we all know uh, the moment we we talk about 3d printing that means it's going to increase a lot of cost for manufacturing definitely this part was a, supposed to be 2.5 times half as of the actual bracket but initially the objective was to make something that can be manufactured using three axes or something or the traditional milling so designers and engineers have found their ways they do not just uh, depend on the software to create the outcomes rather they put in their own experience and skills to design things as per their customizations so this was again redesigned the actual bracket was the outcome generative bracket was redesigned using uh, some boundary conditions and then simulated again so this thing the new bracket was actually even stronger as the actual one and the displacement was almost similar plus it was 47 percent lighter at the same time uh, the user was able, the, the user who used to work on the same machine with the same material with the same expertise can now manufacture this with less material so it is an this was one example and these were the actual brackets that happened moving forward a company called journal motors they have committed to bring 20 electric vehicles to market by 2023 that means improving efficiency and the best way to do that is to reduce weight and complexity. So GM is using this technology to help them reduce the number of parts that go into the car while making them lighter and stronger. This technology helps General Motors engineers develop solutions based on the goals and constraints of a part, like when it can connect to others, when it what it's made of and what loads it need to take. Here, General Motors worked with us to explore a prototype of this part. This is a seat belt bracket. That bracket goes into the rear seat belt that where we fasten that. Having defined the goals and constraints, generative design automatically generated viable options that GM had to choose for this bracket. And this means GM's engineer were able to explore dozens and dozens of valid options faster than they were previously been able to design for a single out, uh, component for all the uh, options available one of their engineers decided upon was this one a solution nearly impossible for human to design alone and yet a human did in partnership with generative design you say technology goes hand in, technology and human goes hand in hand and they work in coherence with human beings a solution Gen general motor designed to be 40 percent lighter and 20% stronger than an original bracket. Not only this, this is now printed as a single part rather than assembled for eight separate components. Now here, understand this. Uh, we, we are talking about automation through generative design, which is enabling General Motors to make parts that are more lightweight and more fuel efficient. When we talk about assemblies and part consolidation, when a part is manufactured in industry, right? It doesn't happen, mostly happen at one places, but there is always a logistics. Many companies have many other vendors to supply and there's a supply chain uh, ecosystem altogether. So one component that has to be shipped from one place to another place, if we include all the cost, logistics, manpower and everything, they were able to save some cost on this actual additively manufactured bracket as compared to the entire assembled part that goes into the seatbelt bracket. But GM's focus, they, it helped them create a better bracket. But think about this, it's just one, one component. What happens? Imagine how much further automation could take GM, how much further all its cars could go, 
and imagine how much fuel would be saved if GM applied generative design to the tens of thousands of parts that goes that make up every one of its cars. Not only G uh, GM, there are other automotive companies too who have joined the race. Here is Volkswagen, and recently re they redesigned their one of the concept omnibus vehicle. You know, this was a omnibus very very famous in 1960s, right? Pretty long time. So they uh, cre created a new product and converted that to electric, tried to save weight and all those things. So this was a concept vehicle. But again, new technologies were explored to try to think of for transformation innovation. Not only that, I, here I present another case study, which is very, very interesting. I mean, India has a staggering number of persons with disabilities. And according to a 2017 uh, study undertaken by Ms. Nandita Saikia, a former Max Planck Research Fellow at Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research, an approximate 26.8 million persons in India have one or another disability. And the most common form uh, of most common form is the movement disability. And this affects 5 million persons in the, uh, in the country. There's a startup called Social Hardware, which is changing life of MPTs from low-income communities from affordable prosthetics. This was founded in 2017, and this is a company dedicated to create sustainable solutions for the society's biggest healthcare problems. Their aim is to systematically replace overseas imports with locally manufactured, locally designed and manufactured goods, enabling healthcare providers to help more people faster and at much lower cost than existing international supply chains. One company, one startup, five individuals, five countries. What's more important here is to understand the operating model that new startups are uh, consuming these days. We live in a very connected world, right? And I, whenever I interact with people, uh, specifically in, from manufacturing industry, uh, I noticed that uh, cloud has never been implemented in this industry, right? A lot of people think and they show a little bit of resistance of moving to cloud-based tools to do design and manufacturing things. There, there are multiple reasons like data privacy and security and all those things. But we have to understand, we live in a very connected world. Even our internet banking and all those things happen over cloud, right? You name anything, our email and everything, everything goes on cloud. Right. So now this is the time where where this manufacturing industry is also taking a big shift and moving from traditional workspace processes to a more connected uh, connected product portfolio. Five countries, five individuals. They were able to use uh, a software called Autodesk Fusion 360 to be connected with each other and to design an amazing product like that. So this is Social Hardware's Human Prosthetic Hand which they designed, which it was designed by actually Furio Tedeschi. So Furio Tedeschi is a, is a concept artist that works in Hollywood. And he collaborated with social hardware with their needs and all those things and managed to create this amazing looking product. What's more important is they call it remote development working model in which they all work remotely, but they're always connected to each other. They use different tools, different cl cloud connected tools to interact with each other. It, 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 that, that also includes online drives, online DNM uh, solutions, online graphic solutions, and all those things. When we talk about then uh, their prosthetic arm, so they did they, uh, when they were doing their pilot study, they noticed that they created this electric uh, prosthetic arm, right, where fingers can move, thumbs can move, and this was no other than a traditional prosthetic arm available in market. They observed we live in India and considering the problems, uh, other than the hi-fi, sci-fi things, people needed something that can help them in their day-to-day -day jobs. That's exactly what social hardware tapped later on. They started thinking of making people superheroes and they started looking for 
actual uh, you know movie uh, uh, movie heroes like you know marvel series and all those things so iron man has something that has in the hands and then you know he's considered a very powerful man definitely it's very hard to make people like an iron man first thing is the looks and then uh, the technology definitely we don't have the art reactor right now they started exploring other things also like spider-man very interesting thing and uh, while exploring this they noticed that there is something like this already available in market it's actually a toy where you can put that on your wrist and then you know it will give you powers like spider-man that's where they decided that they have to redesign their prosthetic hand from a, you know, a, a, a dynamic hand to a more static one with something that can help people in their day-to-day -day jobs. They use technology to create something called this. Definitely, they did not plant a seed of avocado. They made this connector that looks like avocado because of the shape. It's actually a 300 gram stainless steel 317 part to be manufactured on three axis milling. Now you might be thinking, what's going on with this bracket? What is this avocado thing? And how is it going to help people? Well, this avocado thing is going to be placed here, right between your static hand. Okay, static, doesn't move the fingers and all. It's just a static hand, just for the looks. And think about this, when you break your teeth with some accident or with something, right? When you get a new teeth, it's actually uh, static, doesn't move, but it does its job, right? It helps you bite that. So with this static hand, it's just for the show. It looks like a hand, but it doesn't move fingers or thumbs. But after this wrist connector, avocado wrist connector is placed here, it opens up new opportunities for people to connect traditional tools. And Social Hardware did a very in-depth analysis in which they considered tools like these and made these compatible with their wrist connector so that it can hold multiple of these. And anybody who is an amputee they can carry these tools and he can just remove the static hand and quickly place these tools on the wrist connector like that and it's a spring-loaded assembly you know you can just tap it on the ground or your other uh, or your knee or somewhere to remove the uh, remove the tool all right you understand this when we talk about amputee their large portion of their muscle is actually gone due to the amputation and uh, so that means they have less strength in the amputated part. So they decided that 300 grams was a significant increase in the, uh, uh, for the amputee. So they had to reduce that with their own calculations. So they followed some engineering practices to reduce the weight and reduce that further to 168 gram. Later on, they even decided to include technology like generative design to even further optimize the part. And this was the workflow. They created the, all the you know, bearing assemblies and all those things. And finally, they got certain outcomes. And they took up one of that. And finally, it was 56 gram stainless steel, additively manufactured. All right, creating pr pr affordable prosthetics, additive manufacturing metal, definitely not a complimentary choice because it's going to consume a lot of, a lot of thing, um, you know, in investment and all those things. So they redesigned the part with their traditional engineering practices, considering that as the foundation. You see, there is a lot of similarity. And finally, got this, which was the actual 85 gram stainless steel bracket. They did all the simulations and finally observed there is a form factor to the actual static arm. They, they were so attached to their uh, avocado shape they didn't, did not want to lose it on the new bracket. So in the end, they actually combined both of that and came up with this final outcome, which is, uh, and the pork flow looks pretty amazing from 300 gram to 168, to 56, to 85, and then 96. Here's the thing, and that's the actual one. They're still working in the field of prosthetics recently started working on some education technology products, closely working with universities to empower the prosthetic education for uh, design and engineering students. So they all come up with newer solutions to improve this product, this bracket. Uh, so it's actually a pretty interesting story and I personally liked it because I closely worked with social hardware. 
not only that we talk about a lot of things you know when we talk about design design is not just about aesthetics of the product it's the overall experience of your of your product to your customer they also thought of partnering with associate uh, apds you know rehabilitation centers and uh, they actually designed a kit a prosthetic kit like that so any amputee can take this kit to a place a, re a rehabilitation center that will have a small workshop facility and the the person at the rehabilitation center can help amputee with their needs based on you know these the shape and size and all those things what's interesting here here is you see there is this is the instruction manual with no instructions it's just graphics not even infographic so it's a very unique technique social hardware team is very very fond of comic books and they are considering all their experience and all the you know uh, good factors to create an entirely a great brand experience there comes another one it's another company uh, next big innovation labs this is an indian startup who is now taking 3d printing to the next level using the technology for bioprinting human skin think about this 3d printing you know we hear, keep on hearing about alloys and all those things there is a company in india who is doing who is actually 3d printing human skin so this is called bioprinting which uses biological materials such as cells to create a bio ink that's loaded into a bioprinter as the largest organ of the human body our skin is the first line of defense against harmful bacteria it regulates body temperature and facilitates a sense of touch and because skin com comprises of multiple layers making it well suited for layered 3d printing process nbil they are on a mission to reduce animal testing and improve skin implants using 3d bioprinting they also draw uh, nbil draws its on its team's expertise in additive manufacturing synthetic biology material science and computational computational design with the goal, ultimate goal of making a positive impact for india's 1 billion strong population so nbil established a three stage process to create its version of human skin what the company calls inner skin so you see here this is actually the example of a sample skin inner skin that's company's own patented uh, technology this in the first stage known as the pre uh, bioprinting the team extracts skin cells from the skin tissue samples and stores them in a cell bank. They then mix these cells with the company's proprietary bioink form formulation, which goes into a bioprinter. This goes into the bioprinter for the bioprinting stage. This is actually bioprinting. During the final bioprinting stage, the cellular, cellular structures are moved into an incubator set to the right conditions to grow as if, as, as if it's inside a human body very interesting think about this you know is, is going like uh, from skin cell and then uh, 3d bioprinting stage and going into the incubator it's, it all sounds amazing what's even more interesting here is NBIL they created India's first 3d bioprinter all right we are not just talking about a technology they literally recreated a machine and applied technologies different technologies uh, to bring down also the weight and all those, all those other factors. It's all done using sheet metal technology. And, uh, and they, they have, this is a startup's own 3D bioprinter. They call it Trivima. Uh, tri, uh, Trivima. And not just the render, this is the actual uh, product. So you see, they even use technology generated design, specifically in the extruder assembly and they wanted to have certain level of micron precision right and when you look look at the engineering realm of things so there are multiple things that has to be included to for the efficiency so they also use electronic features and all those things into one single platform to keep everybody at the same page when we keep hearing about these technologies you know so there's always a workaround if you can observe uh, even around us product design process has completely changed, right? Project teams and stakeholders, they look to collaborate effectively in the product design uh, development process. We want to do in-person uh, conversations 
live interactions, we want people to be on the same page at the same time. And this also demand a lot of accessibility, re requires a lot of real time collaboration. Collaboration means like we have great tools. Right now we are sharing a lot of things on the Zoom platform, which is amazing. At the same time, we all need tools like these to be more effective and that saves time. At the same time, we all look for integration. That means we look for people to work with each other at the same time. People with multidisciplinary background, industrial design, manufacturing engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, uh, product designer, electronic engineer. Everybody has to give their feedback for a more efficient product, specifically in the, in the ideation phase. That's exactly why we have a tool called Fusion 360. So you see this is a cloud-based integrated CAD, CAM, CAE, and a PCB software that can help you do concept designing, engineering, visualization, simulation, CAM, PCB design, and data management. It offers a lot of opportunities for people. If anybody is into industrial design, have to create quick concept sketch, definitely it can be done using Fusion Sculpt Modeling Workspace. And it can create uh, precise and smooth surfaces with T-spline technology. At the same time, quick examples like products like footwear can be easily done on, uh, was actually done on Fusion with a great workflow. When we talk about engineering, we have, we have a large base of, uh, you know, dissolve, uh, file formats. IGS, SAT, SMT, DWG, and all those things. That requires drawings, assemblies, and other many components. So these things are fully possible here. It's easy to design products like this. This is called Chloro, and it's actually a solar charger design to fit in your home lifestyle. This actually won the sustainability award uh, back in 2018. During the day, Chloro sits as, as a wash on your window, collecting the sun's energy. Oops. At night, you can remove the battery and wirelessly charge your devices any way you like. Fusion offers hybrid modeling workspace. Anybody can work on all four working uh, data set, solid polygon surface and mesh. To make components like these also, uh, consumer electronics, headsets and all those things, it does offer a lot of opportunities. You can import the mesh data of the 3D printed scan data or 3D scan data that is mesh to recreate solid modeling and uh, sculpting on the same workspace. And even create something that is not rocket science, but very, very sustainable, like this sway fiber hanger, which is actually manufactured using recycled uh, waste paper. Definitely never put that in, in uh, put a wet towel on that. Otherwise, it's definitely not going to work for you. Visualization, it also offers a great workspace for visualization. You can create lifelike graphics. We all need that for presentations, marketing purposes, and all those things. So it offers a lot of great opportunities, a library of materials, and camera settings and environments to create renders like that, looking beautiful, or that. Engineering people definitely doesn't go anywhere without simulation. And the same workspace can offer static stress frequencies and these things. So you can always be sure about your product's performance once you create certain design. At the same time, it offers great workspace and opportunities for CAM workspace. That means machine is CNC programming and all these things can be done with real-time program or uh, real-time collaboration with your vendor, with your partner and all those things. And data management. We have to be always seeing. I keep on telling about these things. We have to be at the same pace these days, right? Could be web, could be mobile, could be PC. And we all want to be connected all the time for live updates, feedback sharing, and all other things. At the same time, we also want to be a part of the larger ecosystem where we can import the existing two libraries from Mac Master Card or Parse for CAD or something like that. Not, like, not just that, we also have something, uh, if we want to make electronics, PCBs, schematic, uh, and board files, that's also there in the same tool. So it opens new horizons and collaboration opportunities for 
electronic engineers and product, product designers and engineers. So this is Fusion 360 integrated CAD CAM and CA software and we have a great family, global family and now very very active family in India too. Well that's how you can access that and uh, if you have any questions so this is the right time or if the organizer suggests to take the questions later on I'm also open to that. Thank you so much. We can take two or three questions. Really Definitely. Uh, Danush, can you? Yes, sir. I'll. Uh, uh, thank. Uh, thank you, Varun, sir, for your uh, wonderful insight. Um, uh, so there is a question which most of the netizens have pondered upon: Is Fusion 360 using artificial intelligence for generative design? Yes. So there is an there is a backend algorithm for that. So uh, there is AI definitely. So it and it works with incoherence with our uh, initial work processes. That means when a user inputs a lot of information uh, about uh, material selection, manufacturing constraints, and all those things, these are actually small parameters, right? And there is an algorithm that runs in the backend that computes all the time, like you know, real time simulation. And it tests up upon the part and creates the result. So we can call it AI based thing, but uh, it's definitely not a hundred percent machine learning. It's actually a controlled uh, algorithm that improves the component, optimizes the shape based on hu uh, human input. Okay, uh, we have one more question. So with the available tools and techniques, software and hardware, it's possible, but the big question is at what compromise? Uh, see, uh, one one barrier, one first barrier I see is uh, there is an entry barrier to the mindset, right? So what happens is when we talk about connected uh, devices, connected world, uh, these technologies are are being tested right now. These are not hundred percent tested. That means not hundred percent tested in industry, in market. Consumers are slowly moving towards these things, gaining more uh, confidence to try out different things. And when, when we talk about compromises, definitely, uh, you know, uh, there is an entry barrier to learn to the learning curve, right? When we talk about uh, learning new things, specifically connected technologies that connect software and our uh, machinery industry, the resources working in this industry has decades of experience, right? And getting new things to learn in such a short amount of time can sometimes be challenging. But the good thing is the ecosystem is taking place and there are a lot of uh, uh, content and platforms to help people. This can help a lot of people to uh, onboard with new technologies to get themselves trained and all those that. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, insight into these questions. And uh, I would like to, I would like Renault, sir, to continue with the session. Yeah, uh, uh, sir, Varun, sir, uh, really thank you. So your uh, session was really, you know, was really full of information and uh, it was really inspirational. So many of our students are uh, having, uh, you know, these kind of startups and they are working into these uh, 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 twin plans as well as uh, many prosthetic uh, devices. So I hope uh, your uh, presentation will be inspiring them. So you had both demo as well as case studies, which was uh, really great actually. So this is what uh, we really promised our participants and I, I think you know, uh, they'll be really happy to see it. And developing the project products which can help the, uh, you know, the physically challenged people will be a good value addition to our society more than to anything. It's a very good value addition to the society. You know, it will help them and it will make them you know, more independent, uh, which will you know, really be a very good cause. You know, the case studies like the next big innovation labs and uh, social hardware, uh, we are really, uh, you know, we are really privileged. You know, we, we came to this uh, Fusion 360 Academy and uh, we really interacted with them. And uh, they are really doing a very uh, noble deeds. And I really appreciate their work and I really want them to carry forward Big, big, make their startup into a very big industry and whoever watching this whoever want to do 
very similar type of work i think they can take this as an example and they can know you know carry forward that dream to achieve something you know which is done by these people and i really thank you for your tech for your time and i thank your team uh, deepank patacharya sir and our patri sir for uh, can i can i interrupt or not yeah yes sir yes sir for yeah. uh, for uh, you know, arranging this thing thank you sir uh, i am giving the forum to deepank so i just wanted to just uh, thank varun for this sorry to interrupt you no thank problem varun for his uh, excellent presentation Mm -hmm. i went through the presentation many of the things obviously pretty technical but definitely i think the value of generative design and emerging technologies was conveyed i hope it was useful to the uh, to the audience here i can see about 112 so all yes. these are faculty and students or only faculties so we have faculty students and also external participants okay and, uh, we have also few of our speakers who are also Uh, listening to varun sir's lectures okay well great 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 so thank you varun for a for a good presentation thank you vit for inviting us uh, to this conference and i hope we can even have more and more such sessions so that we can propagate the technologies that we are offering not only to the education community but also to the industry Yeah, yes, sir. I really, I can really tell the good news that Autodesk is really very open-hearted. They are helping us to develop many good uh, works. They are developing uh, many great technologies, and they are sharing these technologies at uh, no cost for uh, students. If you can interact with them, you can get very good chance of exploring their uh, technologies, and they are even helping, you no, know, to connect you with the good people, you no, know, to make your own startups. So they are really doing a very good job. so i uh, i uh, uh, i can really recommend all the participants to go with them join your hands with them now we are really doing you know many things with them and these are very small things you know that that get exposed to everyone we are, we are doing many things so you can just go and explore you can contact these people and you know they will be they are really happy to help you 24/7 365 days <laughs> so it's that's what really thank you for the autodesk team and i really thank varun sir once again deepankar sure. sir and once again uh, my close uh, friend uh, also dr badri sir for uh, yes taking, the man behind the scenes yeah, the man behind the totally. scenes badri sir <laughs> and uh, he never comes before <laughs> yeah yes he is the handsome hero so really thank you autodesk team so we are really uh, privileged and uh, so we are going to start the next session and uh, really thank you thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. you so much thank you thank you thank you sir thank you bye thank you sir bye sir we'll bye. meet again thank you have a good one yes sir yes. thank you dr renault and uh, mr varun and i really enjoyed this presentation yes. but we have started uh, giving lecture i mean we have started uh, you know teaching generative design and fusion physics to the students now uh, i know we are on track uh, we are um, Uh, next week's speaker is available here without much delay and uh, like yesterday i don't want to i want to stick the schedule very uh, tight so um, next speaker we have is uh, mr velmurugan shivaraman from ashok leland um, so um, uh, so he has uh, you know um, he has finished his btech from you know bangalore university and he has uh, vast experience in the automotive technology automotive mobile you know automotive industry and uh, he is now presently assistant general you know manager at um, ashok leland previously he has you know worked work in hyundai i think um, so without much delay let us welcome uh, mr velmurugan shivaraman to deliver the uh, session over to you sir Yes, sir. Unmute, sir. Unmute, sir. Uh, Shreedi, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, you, you have permit me to share my screen. Yeah, that I will do, sir. That that I am doing, sir. Renault can you make 
Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. I think now I have stopped sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then only I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Can we make uh, sir as a co-host, sir? Oh, so sorry, sir. Uh, I thought we uh, could do it. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Sir is now. Yeah, it's over to you, sir. Now it's your sir, session. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Vail Morgan Shivaram, an assistant general manager in Ashok Leather. And, uh, I specifically work in a confidential area of defense vehicle. Srini, sir, I'm audible to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank you, VAT, Mr. Sandal Kumar, Mr. Srinivas Narayanan, and the staff for taking this opportunity to share my views and opinions. And what are all the disturbing technologies that will be disturbing the product design and development? You see, I think I am the only speaker in this two days session who is presenting my case as an user, not as an OEM. People talk about softwares, hardware, everything. But it, when it comes to the end user, like me, who really uses, what is the actual problem we are facing? That's what we are going to discuss. And there are certain disclaimers. I want to put whatever the views, opinions that I am sharing to the firm. Is absolutely mine, not my organization. The first one. The second one, the pictures this well, that we are going to share in the presentation is downloaded from internet. It's not mine. Okay. So first of all, let us take this session. I think uh, Dr. Srinivas will agree with me. I would like to have a 10 to 15 minutes of question and answer. I am not uh, very great in uh, doing a presentation for one hour, two hour and hour. The floor is yours, sir. Sorry for interruption. Yeah, it's okay, doctor. No problem. You can do whatever. Yeah, see, first of all, let us say something about what is this product development that was the title given to us. I inserted one more word inside called a design. It, come, it, it has two faces or two portions. Without designing a product, you cannot develop a product. Let us understand that. And the today's students think the legacy conversion is the designing, which is very, very wrong. It's not converting a 2D drawing, which is in a platform, and making it into a 3D model, whether you are going to use Pro Engineer, our ideas, our CATIA, our SOLIDWORKS, our solid edge, our Pro Engineer, or CREO, whatever the software it may be, that is not designing. Let us understand that very clearly. That we technically call that as a legacy conversion. So people think the moment I know how to use and operate the software, 3D modeling software, people think I know designing. No. We are doing a huge mistake. Okay. Let us agree to disagree with all the presenters. Product designing is one portion, and whereas product development is another portion. Product development, product designing is an area where we are thinking about the requirement of a customer or an end user. Simply, we call that in the voice of the customer. The voice of the customer is converted into data or an information. That information or data is converted into product. Depending upon the necessary requirement of the user, I am designing my product. The product may be a physical product or it may be a virtual product. What we are today speaking is about the physical product that is being used. Okay, now 
take an example of a smartphone mobile phone or whatever the way you call it how many times we use a phone as a phone a fraction very minimal hold on a second so it is very minimal for many of us the phone calls constitute just a fraction of how we use our personal devices and what are all the other things we are doing we stream music we capture images and find directions gps locations browse the internet whatsapp linkedin whatever you say it your smartphone have it now understand the product is meant for communication purpose phone whether it is a mobile phone or a smartphone is meant for communication but the major idea of using a particular purpose for what the phone is made is very very minimal and it is being used for some other purpose now consider this smartphone or mobile phone it has tens of sensors actuators okay this is nothing but your smartphone is nothing but an iot app in your packet okay now tell me when this particular product the smartphone is designed do you think the ultimate end user is going to use this particular product smartphone to kill camera market radio market music market some 10 15 years back kodak was the world largest camera manufacturer understand that and film manufacturer but today no one knows where kodak is there except the slr market that is the kind of change disruptive technology coming inside the product which is designed for some other purpose creating a niche market for itself so this iot is going to play a very very important role that's what i feel what is iot iot is nothing but internet of things okay iot is changing the very concept of designing a product and it's completely a new field understand one thing product design and development is normally it used to be very linear you cannot come back how to make a full cycle that means from capturing the customer requirement creating the concept and making a preliminary design then going for a simulation verification we say that again go for product uh, proto development proto development you go for a physical validation of the product capture durability endurance performance criteria of the particular product and whatever it is not meeting whether it is a durability factor or an endurance or performance factor of the product you have to once again come back to concept level from the concept level you have to it is not interconnected because then you will be able to understand how this product is going to performance based on the dur durability endurance performance criteria once you make the proto using the iot you can make this linearly currently existing product development in an interconnected product development procedure because understand one thing when we say product design and development lots of people miss one very important parameter 
every industry will be having a service industry parts that's supply to the service industry that it is on a guarantee warranty or replacement it is used there when a product go for a service center we see only the one portion the chap who is sitting there in the service center ask whether it is under the warranty or guarantee if it is under warranty guarantee it is done at free of cost or if it is out of warranty and guarantee you they charge you but what actually happen to the replaced old part it is taken back a loss of simulation and analysis verification validation was done on the part so it acts as an data supplier for the designer to take that opportunity to the next level in the product designing and development it takes a huge amount of time for the design engineer to capture all these data which went wrong when it went wrong where it went wrong these are all the critical informations for a designer but what actually happens lots of people don't share informations or data it is supposed to be very secretive in nature okay this iot will have a big data once you say the big data you know the big data will be converted into data analytics then it go to data mining artificial intelligence comes and plays a very important role and from there the optimized correct information correct problem see for an engineer what is engineering engineering is nothing but providing a solution in the most simplest time i am trying to see engineering is nothing but providing a solution for a problem but the real problem is a problem when somebody comes to you they won't define the problem completely that's where we have issues and problem they will give you a 30 to 40 percentage or 50 to 60 percentage of the problem and you will be trying to solve the problem using your engineering tools or the technology that is available with you and once you come to an full shape that time the user will come he will tell you the balance 40 percentage 40 percentage of the information provided by the end user customer will be a complete 180 degree shift to what he already mentioned to the 0 to 60 degree scale we are having an issue because nobody in the world come with a 100 percentage defined problem to an engineer see taken case of a civil engineer for an example people will come and tell i want a three bedroom attached bathroom and a big hall so that i can have an 65 inch led tv i want a swimming pool i need two car parking okay i want to have a roof garden everything the moment the civil engineer asks that chap who comes for with this proposal what is your plot size he will be it is 20 by 30 this is a constraint that's where a engineer comes and plays a role he will say okay boss don't worry if it is 20 and 30 we will have two floors three floors the ground floor you will be having the swimming pool the first floor you will be having a car parking in second floor you will be having two bedroom whereas in the third you will be having the third bedroom and hall don't expect the end user to define his requirement completely it is not going to happen but the moment this iot comes actually this iot business started in some where in uh, 2010 this a to kick start there is a huge uh, what's it called uh, claims we got done this we got done that but definitely it is going to 
affect the way we live. So that when it is going to affect the way we live, definitely it will be affecting the product that we are going to use. IoT is one area where we have to look for the usage of IoT into product design and development. The second thing that I feel where we are going to see a big change is the multi care options. I exactly don't know what is the software that is being taught at VIT. But in the market share, Adolis, AtoCAD, SolidWorks, Inventor, and uh, NX, Creo, SolidEdge, Kataya, these are all the softwares play a very important role. They have a considerable amount of market share when we come to 3D modeling, simulation, verification, validation, whatever you want to see. Just understand the ProE file extension is .prt, .asm, .drw. These softwares have some 10 to 20, 30 file extensions. And I don't know how many people will remember that ideas is basically in SDRC ideas. That SDRC ideas. They use .mf and .mf2. And the SCATIA V5, which is a DASO product, they use CAT part, CAT product, CAT drawing. And NX, we have PRT. And for Pro Engineer, we have .prt, .asm, .drw. And for SOLIDWORKS, we have SLD part, SLD, ASM, SLD, DR. These are all the fine extensions that is used by these 3D model modeling softwares. Just imagine, I am working in an automotive industry. We exclusively use KTM. But my own engineer and use Pro Engineer. Why? Each and every software have their own plus and minus portions inbuilt. A software which is very good for an A-class surface will be very, very poor. When you use a software forging or sheet metal or for casting, that's the truth. You won't find a single software which can be used for all the manufacturing process. Understand that. Autodesk, AutoCAD, and Autodesk Inventor are from Autodesk. SolidWorks and Kata are from. Yes, so NX solid edge that is from Siemens crayon pro engineer they are from PTC they give you lots of names and nowadays these gentlemen come with a file format are saying you can straight away download the native file of KTI into some other software. But understand one thing basically, there is a design intent in between each and every design engineer before he put his hand on the mouse. That design intent is an explicit, implicit knowledge of the design. It's not the ownership of the software. Software is a tool. Understand that if you say the software, I want to draw a line, you can take the mouse, go and click that line command, and you have to pick the starting point and ending point. That's all it do. But where to start and where to end the particular line is the decision of the designer, whether it is at 0 to 180 or 0 to 270 or 0 to 90. These are all the decisions taken by the designer, not by the softwares. Imagine a car industry is having a 
SDRC ideas. There are lots of bottom items in the, for an example, steering, front axle, rear axle, brake system, electrical, electronics, okay, engine cooling, clutch. Normally, the body in white and cabin in white. These are all the things that will be at the ownership of the car company. Engine, most probably they will be manufacturing. But axles, engine cooling, like um, DAT, radiator, air intake system, these will be proprietary item. So if somebody want to use an air cleaner, which is made in solid works. Being a vehicle manufacturer, I am using Kataya. It has to be converted into neutral file format, that is IGS, step VRML. Okay. Then it comes as a solid dump to me. You understand? There is no parameter. If I want to change, even a dimension which is 160 into 161, I have to throw a mail to my supplier, boss, the dimension 160 should be converted into 161, kindly do it. This have its own time. Let's imagine an ideal situation with an universal standard Hope maybe in my lifetime it comes. These software manufacturers agrees within them to use a neutral platform to do the designing and the interoperability of the software in between the software is really good. So if one software is very good at forging, let us do the forging in the particular software and take the next level of modeling. If it is in sheet metal, we will go to the some other software and the assembly can be done at any other software, which is the most simplest format. But now today we don't have that kind of luxury. See the whole business runs behind money. Whether it is you or me or anybody in the industry, people want to make money. We have to financially support our industry. Whether it is your skill set or core competency, domain knowledge, you should be used to make a product design and development. What do you think after doing the product design and development, it is going to sit in the shelf? Definitely no. There is a market value for that. People will take it in the other way if I tell the truth. A successful product design, the future of you in a career in the industry where you are going to work. So it is literally not possible for a single gentleman to learn all these softwares. There is a huge difference between, I don't know how many people in this firm, know how to operate this AutoCAD, SolidWorks, NX, Cryo, Solid Edge, and Kataya. In this one software, which is a little bit different, is this Cryo. Because in all other software, whatever I use, you have to use a manufacturing methodology, then you will go to a wireframe parameter. But whereas in Cryo, you will be first creating a parametric wireframe, then you will be going back to the manufacturing process. The names are different. In one software, you will call that as X2. In another software, the same function, purpose will be called as a pad. So these things, unification of these softwares will have its own impact in the product design and development in the near future. Then going back to this MBD and MBE, okay. What is this MBD and MBE? This model build 
dimensions and enterprise now we are using a separate you can say that where you make a product the product may be depending upon the nature it may be a single component or part but to my knowledge lots of products consist of assemblies that assemblies consist lot of sub assemblies and sub assemblies consist of lots of parts or components inside that so when you come back from down to up the components we are talking the individual part so you will be having a 3d model if it is cat it will be called as dot cat part and if it is pro engineer it is dot prt file and if it is side works it is called dot sld prt these are all the file extensions that is being used by individual softwares so you have a 3d model the 3d model is designed by you you mentioned what is the length breadth height width the thickness whatever it is and again you are converting all those things into a drawing the drawing file format for pro engineer it is called drw and in cat ai we have cat drawing and in pro engineer we have dot drw these are on the file formats that is used my only question is when i designed or when i developed one particular component in a 3d model why should i have one more paper drawing is it really required if i can provide all the parameters all the functions all the variants inside the 3d model itself which will support my manufacturing okay to the full extent that will be really useful that means i am not going to lose any data unless otherwise my basic concept of designing making my 3d model itself is wrong this mbd provides a more complete picture than most 2d drawings or 3d models adding dimensions surface finish material tolerance and more to be to the model delivering the non geometric information that is used to require a separate 2d drawing and documents are avoided mbd is a computerized design or when 3d ma solid model is a master it becomes the master primary based on that you can have your manufacturing actually you can ask me when you make a design a 3d model in a software it gives only the 3d model of the part it never mentions the manufacturing process or tooling or the equipment or the assembly line or the inspection plan it won't but this model based dimension it will further graduate itself into model based enterprise when it goes to my down the line supplier i am going to ah uh, skartik kartik t any questions you want to ask me plus no, i think you can continue sir i think we will let us have that at the end sir Should yeah yeah okay so this utilization actually if you ask me real murugan this mbd and mbe is it not already available yes it is already available and being in uh, traditional organizations we always believe in black and white so we need a a0 size drawing we need an a1 a2 a3 f2 to this point but in future this model based dimension and model based enterprises is going to be the future of this product design and development and next is the additive 
manufacturing or what's it called uh, 3d printing actually if you ask me in a layman's language i will tell you 3d printing or additive manufacturing is nothing but an rapid prototype this technology is there for last 10 15 years i think dr uh, srinivas will agree with me you know the first time in south india it is in anna university it was introduced they had one uh, separate prototyping center in anna university gindi campus it evolved it further developed now it became a 3d printing technology i think lots of you people may be knowing about this 3d printing allies this additive manufacturing my only request to this forum is keep an eye on the convergence of the 3d printing and the 3d cat data before you will be making 3d model in one software export that model into stl format send it to gindi campus and i university they will be doing the prototype there may be a loss of information during this export and import okay so basically this additive manufacturing is a process of building an object or a part or a product one thin layer at a time requiring multiple software packages that was some time back now each and every software oem have his own 3d printing platform that is a beauty we are not going to discuss this additive manufacturing because i don't think i can cover all these subjects what we are discussing today in one hour i think this forum will agree with me it is individual domain you take iot maybe we should spend two, two three days mbd and mb it will take some other like you know individually it will take two to three days we are trying to compress so that we will be within the timeline i want to highlight one industrial development or you can call that as a research currently we are using 3d printing and it is manufacturing but we are talking about 4d printing what is 4d printing 4d printing is nothing but a 3d printing the fourth dimension being the time i am trying to introduce a geometric genetic code inside my design using the smart materials which will change itself based on depending upon the timeline that will be a beauty now what we are doing we are designing a beam we are designing a bracket saying it is x kg os for something this x kg become 10x or 100x what will happen to the particular part or product it will fail it should fail that is a correct engineering word i want to use because the moment the load becomes crosses the factor of safety it should fail but just imagine a virtual case scenario i have a part with an inbuilt geometric code using a smart material the moment this x force become 10x the geometric code initiate a strengthening action to the building material so that it can take the 10x load that is the future of this additive manufacturing people are already working on that let's imagine a case simplest format i will tell you i am buying a shoe from adidas or from nike do you think that shoe should exactly match the profile of vel murgan's feet no 
these are all the items using some standard functionality standard parameters manufactured they only ask you what is your shoe size 8 9 10 based on that they give you a shoe otherwise if you are having a unique profile in your feet you have to go for a custom made shoe just understand one situation i am buying a shoe that shoe can adapt to the profile shape and size of my feet over a period of time say 3 days or 4 days then it exactly fits as per my requirement that is 4d printing this 4d printing don't ask me well more is it possible definitely it is possible the kind of technology that coming in the kind of development that is happening in the material science smart materials are coming in this additive manufacturing played a very very important role the way the engineer design a part i think when my time my time means in who did engineering in 84 to 90 so we have to design a product based on the manufacturing process the process for a sheet metal is not same as casting is not same as forging or welding it is individual so each part is designed based upon the manufacturing methodology it's not a common you make one individual part and the same individual part can be used throughout any other process no is manufacturing process have one unique way of designing but this additive manufacturing 3d model 3d printing changed the whole scenario if you know how to make a 3d model in the software that model can be made as a physical part or a physical component using additive manufacturing but understand one thing there is one point which i already told you know serviceability and maintainability we call that as sam service assess and maintainability that is very important for every product whether it is an automobile industry or whatever you say that serviceability is one important things that too you know specifically for indians i know some of my close friends use the paste food paste tube they press it with pencil they will take the last drop of the paste and they will brush it the maximum utilization of the product just yes, imagine there is a crack in the wheel rim our people will go to a roadside shop they will weld it they will reuse it they will not immediately go for new wheel rim unless otherwise nothing can be under on that particular wheel rim they will go for a repair service of the product when you use this additive manufacturing unless otherwise the serviceability maintainability and accessibility of the product is not defined taken care during the 3d modeling the initial phase concept phase itself it will become a use and throw part or use and throw product just imagine what is the kind of casting and pricing that will go inside that an engineer will become a full engineer when he knows about the casting and pricing the profitability the market for a product then he becomes 100% engineer then going to the next thing it is the augmented reality actually it is not the products that are the only things changing in current scenario the tools 
we are using that are also shifting now. And I think lots of people will be knowing about this virtual reality. And what is this augmented reality? Augmented reality is nothing but the cousin sister of virtual reality. But this cousin is going to impact the design work. It delivers a critical information for the frontline workers exactly when and where they need it. Now, just when you buy a new product, whatever it may be inside the package, you can see a user manual printed in 12 different languages with some pictures in the do's and don'ts. But future, it is not going to be like that. The future will be based on this augmented reality. Just imagine there's a helicopter in Rajasthan. There's it somewhere. You got stuck. Only the driver is there. The pilot is there. And he want to repair. He want to come home. So now you can use it AR technology. So when we design a cab for a vehicle, already using virtual reality, you can have a complete 3D platform. But using this AR, you can sit inside the cab in the driver's seat and you can cross-check the human factors, ergonomics, and accessibility of the control system. This augmented reality will give you some funny features also. You are in a car, you send augmented reality, the whole map, the GPS location, the environmental data, all these things can be projected on your windscreen. And you can have an internet browser on your windscreen, such a huge display. But all these things should be done when the vehicle is in static condition, not in dynamic condition. Okay. And there is one more slide. And this particular slide is already taken care by Warren Heta. Lots of information he shared. This is the latest bus trend that is in industry, this generative design. But understand one thing, this generative design is promising to revolutionize products and the way it is being made. Drawing on cloud computing and artificial intelligence, the technology creates design. Unlike anything engineers can imagine or that might come up with their own. Generative design is a technology in which 3D models are created and optimized by these softwares. But the basic input details and data should be provided by the design engineer. Okay. The user should set up the requirements for the model, such as manufacturing process, load, constraints. Then the software offers you various shape and sizes. Okay. And these are all the technologies. These are all the disruptive technologies that is really going to disturb the way we make this product design and development. When we talk about this product design and development, kindly understand it is not only making a 3D model in a software platform. How to make it? Always consider the cost to portion. That is very important. If a particular part can be made using a simple engineering methodology by fabrication, general engineering methodology, kindly go for that. Don't complicate engineering manufacturing process. Understand the design intent. 
ultimate performance is very very important than individual performance of the parts are the assemblies are components collectively it should perform as far as we are discussing you know loss of components level we are not bothered about the aesthetics aesthetics is for the outer periphery the inner strength core functional performance plays a very important role in making this product design and development successful with this i stop my session i will hand over to mr uh, shrinivasan uh, narayanan doctor if any Sir. questions please kindly questions if any savitoj or uh... danush yes sir uh, uh, hello sir uh, hello velmurugan sir there is a question yeah so what are the steps you would suggest for a startup to break into the market when even the prototypes are too costly to build and test see it depends where you are going to position the product as a person I am basically a military vehicle designer. I will iterate in the design level ten, twenty, thirty times. We make five to ten photos. We give it for verification, validation, both in software line and in physical durability, endurance, performance criteria. Okay. this is one thing where you can never skip any product development step there is one more thing consumer product is also a product design and development for an example a toothbrush which is going to cost 15 rupees or 20 rupees in the market nobody is going to take the risk of going for a proto and doing for a durability endurance verification validation that low cost consumer products it depends where you are going to position your product to which market that is the most important thing understand one thing launching a product in a short span of time is not going to be a winning solution the moment it comes to market people will be knowing this is a good product or bad market by wordings of the mouth the product will be killed are you interested in taking that kind of risk that's a question sir next yes sir although new technologies like 3d printing additive manufacturing fantasies how much of it is actually feasible in real industry and what are the drawbacks <laughs> uh to tell the truth see casting forging general engineering methodology these fellows already manufacturing process already they had done their um, triple phd 5 phd 10 phd is a matured manufacturing process people understand when you say is a casting part or a forging part but it is a building general engineering methodology part but now only our generative design and our 3d printing additive manufacturing are they are doing their lkg ukg okay see there is one particular term called mvq when you design a part it goes to strategic sourcing when the strategy sourcing the drawings go to your supplier then the supplier will throw back a mail saying i need 1000 numbers as mvq that is minimum order quantity you will be making one proto but the supplier is saying you buy from me 100 or 200 or 500 imagine a case past versus actual utilization of the part to make one part i have to scrap 199 part and i have to pay for 200 part there's a problem with casting and forging 
but additive manufacturing is completely new technology you can make one part because here the material utilization is almost 100% dead take other manufacturing process casting forging sheet metal for to the because the scraps are coming out the material removal process manufacturing process but whereas additive manufacturing is deposition metallurgy it deposits the material layer by layer as of now additive manufacturing may be used if you have one part or two part even though it is costly it will work out profitable for you as the quantity is one or two but you have a large volume better go for some other manufacturing methodology as of now today's current scenario maybe after 5 years or 10 years 3d printing or additive manufacturing may become as cheap as other manufacturing process that time additive manufacturing will be competing with casting or forging or sheet metal but certain materials certain design that will be suitable 100 percentage for additive manufacturing there is no question about it i know lots of aerospace industry using this manufacturing of additive manufacturing and 3d printing and you people know maybe know you know the individual cost of this aerospace materials is huge so they don't mind making it through additive manufacturing but if you are in a cutthroat short profit margin or very small competitive pricing kindly don't go for this additive manufacturing as of now it is a futuristic trend we are discussing today my interest and vat interest is as a engineer you should be knowing after completion of the course mechanical in vat the moment you go out if somebody ask you what is generative design or additive manufacturing you should be in a position to explain at least the basics of that because we people who in the industry we ourselves don't understand the nitty-gritty of this 3d generative design and this additive printing it is new to us i have 30 years experience in this industry it will be a little bit difficult for you to understand but it is a good technology yeah? understand it it removes the restriction of the manufacturing process but it is compromising on the serviceability why there is a part exhibited in the, um, my screen do you think you can do some welding there if it is broken if there is a damage do you think that welding wire and the welding holder will go and say this particular part and the repairability of this part is 100 percentage no the problem with generative design in additive manufacturing is the moment it, it is under repair you have to replace one is to one that's where the problem comes so exercise caution before jumping this to new technology available in the market now it may be very much interesting to study and to present like me but it is very very difficult to incorporate in the industry immediately next uh, uh, thank you for your wonderful answer sir uh, that was all from the q and a now i request uh, shrinivasan sir to take over uh, sir um, actually uh, uh, very thanks very much vermulagan sir for this uh, talk so it appears to me that uh, um, it, 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 it sends me the signal that change is the only thing uh, you should uh, you know go and adapt and uh, look for the opportunity you cannot stick on your old traditional conventional old method of manufacture at the same time uh, still 3d printing is uh, to add on this uh, your presentation still 3d printing is a thrust area where we are getting funds and projects and the 4d printing even 5d printing also new to us and thanks for bringing this uh, you know on this floor and um, and with thanks for the presentations and your presentations is like a complete package where uh, we had a, a, a speakers they have talked extensively about generative design and they are overboard about the generation but your presentation having the importance to these disruption technologies 
applicable to this uh, product and development sector and thanks very much sir thanks for your presentation sir thanks thank you thanks uh, doctor thank you very much very kind thanks. of you i would thanks. like to say my best wishes to vat and to the staffs yeah. and please kindly organize last programs like this yeah yeah please sir, pandemic please. covid situation no i cannot people cannot come to vat directly we cannot share our and experience and knowledge but i think this is a very good initiative taken yeah. by vat yeah. to invite people like us and thank you thank you for thanks, all sir. the participants thanks. and for the rnss thanks, thank you very much thanks bye you are uh, an sir danush uh, uh yes sir ah uh, uh... Sir, we will start with the introduction, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon to one and all present here. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, who has over six years of research experience and three years of teaching experience. After completing his BE in mechanical, he completed his ME in CAD CAM engineering before completing his PhD. in manufacturing engineering with a focus on welding from annamalai institute in the year 2017 not only this he has also completed his mba in human resource from bharatiya university coimbatore currently he is pursuing his post doctoral research at university of coimbra portugal before which he also was worked as a, an associate professor at sri vidyaniketan engineering college Tirupati One of the highlights of his career was his role as the research fellow at DRDO New Delhi where he worked on projects titled Evaluation of Fatigue Fracture Toughness and Ballistic Performance of Friction Stir Welded Aluminum Alloy and Evaluating the Stress Corrosion Cracking of Friction Stir Welded Armor Grade Aluminum Alloy to name a few For today's session he will speak on the topic friction based additive manufacturing for industry 4.0 so let us all welcome dr s sri sabri to share his expertise okay thank you uh, for the nice introduction danush uh, uh, before starting my presentation i would like to thank the organizing committee uh, specifically dr renald for inviting me uh, to give the presentation uh, thank you so let me start my presentation okay so today we are going to discuss uh, okay it's kind of a discussion only uh, about the uh, friction based additive manufacturing processes for the industry 4.0 so i took a very softer approach uh, of my presentation preparation uh, i uh, in order to stick to the uh, the title of this uh, uh, workshop so i framed uh, in order to stick to that title 
So the content of my presentation is introduction about this friction-based additive manufacturing process, and then the need of the solid state additive manufacturing process, then introduction, uh, a bit more introduction about that uh, very particularly, and finally the potential and challenges of that processes. Okay, so let me give a very, uh, very uh, like a history of uh, the industrial revolution. So uh, whenever we start uh, doing a work or a project or, or a research, uh, people used to ask, what is the application? Where it is going to apply? That is the first question uh, arises when you are going to start any of the work. So whatever we are doing is mainly focusing on the industry. So what industry needs, we are going to do that. So in the industry first, uh, people are using the machines uh, in the industrial revolution second, uh, where people are looking for the mass production and the industrial revolution third people are looking for the automation and finally now we are in we are looking for the smart manufacture so the industrial 4.0 mainly focusing on the smart manufacture so whatever the researchers or whatever things we are going to do or we are going to plan it should be focused on the industrial need uh, the one of the uh, thing we are going to uh, discuss more here it is the 3d printing because uh, Nowadays, like there is no particular stream of work. It is a combination of all the uh, departments, like uh, I can say. So uh, in order to do a, like for example, in order to do a, a vehicle or you're going to do a, an, an electrical vehicle or anything, you, you need a help from an electronics background guy and you need a help from, from electrical and you need a help from a computer for computer engineer for a uh, program. So we need a club of all the people. And most particularly as a mechanical engineering, uh, we can invest more of our idea on the 3D printing. So today we are going to talk more about the 3D printing. So most of you are aware about what is the additive manufacturing. So I'm not going to explain about that. But I, I have to highlight a point. Is additive manufacturing a new concept? Of course not. It is a variant of a welding. So you, you take a two plate and uh, you allow an electrode, uh, you deposit a, uh, the molten electrode over a plate in order to join the material, then it is called welding. So additive manufacturing is nothing but instead of only one pass, you are doing 10 or 20 or 50 or 60 process, uh, passes, welding passes over one over another. There comes the additive manufacturing. So in this figure, you can find the same welding setup. In Here, the object is different. In, our, uh, in the welding, we are having an object of joining two material. And here, we are not having that objective. We are having a different objective, layering uh, the molten material one over another in order to form a shape or in order to form an object or something. So that is the additive manufacturing. So it is a birth from the welding processes. Okay, so additive manufacturing uh, is, is not so successful when it comes to the metallic. Uh, even in the previous uh, presentation, uh, it was rightly pointed out. It is now in the research. Why it is still in the research? It is not in the uh, industry because additive manufacturing was started long before uh why it is still uh, in a research because it have a lot of lot of challenges people are uh, uh, looking for uh, some kind of techniques or some kind of modification in the current techniques uh, in order to overcome such challenges there are some successive rates uh, uh, or successive things in the uh, polymers okay like a plastic based uh, or polymer based materials However, when come to the metallic, we have a lot of problems. So what are they? We are going to see one by one. The very first thing is high melting point. So compared to the polymer-based polymer, polymer -based products, the metallic-based products are uh, having the high melting point. So you, you need a very big heat source in order to melt the metallic powders or metallic fillers or metallic electrodes. So the, the temperature, the working temperature is itself a challenge over there. The second one is lower normalized strength. Uh, this means uh, we can approach uh, this thing in a two way. The first thing is, for example, your component having a, a dissimilar material. For example, there is a T, uh, T uh, component. 
so the, uh, there are two comp uh, two two parts uh, web and flange the web is made up of aluminium and the flange is made up of uh, steel so there should be a normalized strength a, a good normalized strength with respect to the base material strength so when we are going for uh, the metallic additive manufacturing processes uh, you will not you could not uh, uh, get the base material uh, strength uh, in the 3d manufactured uh, product and the next one is complex powder based systems so uh, you know that there are two types of uh, two types of uh, uh, the additive manufacture process we can categorize into way, many many ways but there, there is a way to uh, categorize as powder based and another one is the filler based so in the powder based the powder based metallic material is used as the uh, uh, the consumables or the base materials in order to make the component 3d component and in the filler based you will have electrodes or a filler material just a, it's like a rod okay uh, or, a, or, a, uh, or a filler material rolled on a spool so when it comes to the powder based system handling powder is very very difficult you know uh, the powder there is a interaction between the powder so there may be a stickness uh, uh, a lot of problems handling the powders will be a lot of problems so it's a complex powder based systems and then expensive consumables so again i am saying about the powder based systems because if you take a 1 kg of uh, aluminum material it's around uh, um 600 rupees in a bulk form in a solid form but if you are getting a 1 kg of uh, aluminum in a powder form uh, for example in a, a micron level it may be a 6000 or if it is in a nano size it is maybe a 60000 so you see the bulk material uh, the cost of a bulk material and the cost of the uh, the powder form it's totally a uh, different things so there is a expensive consumables and then the metallurgical issues so you all know about uh, the casting processes and welding processes so the melting of material it's it's nothing but a, a casting or a welding like kind of thing so uh, you all know about what are the various casting defects so all the defects will be here and you know all about the welding defects like all the defects will be here because Uh, it involves in lot of heat the very first point is high melting point so we are going for uh, the melting of the material so the melting will leads to a lot of uh, solidification related problems so all the points what i am highlighted here uh, are uh, are the problems or the challenges faced during the uh, conventional available additive manufacturing process so what are they so the the processes as you all know that this is a electron beam uh, melting process and selective laser melting process these are the conventional and the industrial use uh, uh, using uh, additive manufacturing process so the previous slide is based on this uh, processes you can also in include the 3d printing like uh, the filler uh, melting or kind of things so uh, to be particular uh, what are the problems facing for example when we are using the electron beam uh, melting uh, we are having the residual stress induced cracking and the electron beam melting uh, setup itself an expensive setup because the electron beam will pass uh, through the uh, vacuum atmosphere so you need a vacuum chamber and all the setup will be in a vacuum space so uh, it itself an expensive things and when we are coming to the selective laser melting process you will have a higher melting and uh, and this said the metallurgical uh, uh, microstructures like epitaxial uh, uh, microstructures uh, and you it also leads to some of the cracks and then when uh, when you are using the powder there coming to the powder aspects you will have a balling and balling voids uh, a partially melted zones because uh, the powders are exposed under the laser beam uh, the powders some of the powders will be over melted some may be uh, uh, okay correctly melted optimally melted and some may be under melted so that is comes under the partially melted zone and uh, the over melted uh, particles uh, form together or agglomerated together to form the balling so it's like a small powders will group together 
So these kind of problems are faced. Uh, these are the problems I'm, I'm highlighting uh, with respect to or in the, in, in the terms of the process. So I am depicting some of the pictures here. Uh, these are the these are not my pictures. These are taken from the literature and it is referred here. So when we are using the laser uh, selective laser melting process, you will have uh, the problems like key, keyhole process, which is seen in the first set of figure A B C D. Uh, you are having a keyhole formation during the laser uh, processes. So uh, you may have uh, such kind of uh, uh, holes there, pores there, and in addition to that. You will also have uh, the metallurgical pores, uh, which, which is because of the entrapment of the gases, uh, which was formed uh, during the melting of the powders. And in the second set of figure, you can find uh, a wire arc additive manufacturing process. It is also a conventional uh, metal additive pro uh, process. Here you can find the macro level crack, uh, which is highlighted in the figure C. Uh, this is mainly uh, because of the residual stress and uh, due to some of the metallurgical uh, reasons, you will also have some of the cracks. Uh, and uh, in the last two figures, it is uh, a picture related to selective laser melting. There is a possibility of over melting and under melting problems will be there. So because of that, you will have some of the uh, pores, uh, uh, so which will leads to uh, a failure of the component. So these are all the problems of the uh, fusion melting um, metal additive ma manufacturing. Okay. So this is a simulation of the microstructure. What is happening uh, when you are going for uh, a powder based uh, additive manufacturing process? So here the process is the selective laser melting. Okay. So the process is very simple. Uh, you are applying a layer of powder over there. Then the laser heat source is uh, passed over the powders. It melted the uh, powders and this, it forms the solid, okay? So you can see the picture, uh, see the simulation here. A powder is laid, a laser source, or it may be of any source, okay? It's a simulation, so I'm not uh, pointing only the selector laser, it may be of electron beam also. Okay. So Professor Badri, sorry to disturb you, sorry. So that is a screen which is blanking. Blocking your presentation, sir, on the right hand side corner. If you can minimize that screen because participants are requesting. On the right hand side, there is a screen which is blocking. So, uh, Renald, are you talking to me? Yeah, yes, sir, Brisa. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Uh, I'm not having such thing. Let me check once. Uh, from the Zoom, we can find no, some screen is coming. Uh, in one second. Let me check that. Are you participants? Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, no, no, so still it is there. Still it is there. Uh, on the right hand side, there is something which is coming. One second, let me check. Oh, uh, Renown. Yes, sir. Uh, this Gopi here. Uh, I think uh, that is a. Uh, uh, I think uh, the the presentation. Uh, can you stop sharing and uh, share the desktop instead of uh, the application window? Share the desktop. You are, you are talking to me, or uh... Uh, sir? Uh, uh, Sabri, sir. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I am the technical person. So okay. stop sharing and uh, share again. Uh, while sharing, uh, choose the desktop instead of the application window. We'll see that whether this problem gets solved or not. Okay, uh, please tell me now. Is it uh, there is a yeah, problem? Click, now? The, click the green color uh, share share screen button. So the first is, uh, option is a uh, screen. No, uh, choose that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now I think it will be fine. So now can you share the presentation? Sorry. Is it okay now? Uh, yeah. It is now. This blank uh, is not coming. So can you just share your presentation now? Second, one second. I'll just open your question. Okay, is it okay now? No, not it's not shared. Okay, so one second. One second. Visible. One second. One second.
click the share button choose the screen first uh, window instead of application window or the, uh, okay 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 now is oh. it okay now also same problem sir but i don't have any pop ups open here uh, i can, sir, can see can you go only... to next slide can you go to just press up arrow or down arrow sabri sir yeah yeah i'm doing is it okay yeah Make it clear, na? Huh? Sabri sir, yeah, yeah, it's visible for me, sir. Make it. Yeah. Ah, uh, I think no, it's visible buddy. for everybody. No, still the there is a uh, a black color. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the right hand side, yeah, black, black, uh, solid. Uh, you know, it's blocking the view of uh, the third set of box of. So yeah, now it is okay. Maybe it's okay, black, sir. sir. Yeah, somewhat it is okay, sir. Now, sir, please, sir, you can continue, sir. I think. Okay. Now it is done. Yeah. Thank you. So, sorry for. Ah, no problem. No problem. Sorry for. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Okay. So coming to this simulation. Okay. So here you can find uh, the microstructure uh, of the. Uh, the component which is based uh, which is made based on the uh, powder based technique so you can find uh, you are having a lot of blocks there that blocks is called as grains uh, you know uh, there is a wall in a building which is made up of a lot of bricks so that is called as the building block similarly we are having the grains uh, that grains are the building blocks for the metallic structures so so based on the grains as like the wall you are having a standard uh, size for the bricks so if you exceed the size or if you uh, have a small size of the bricks your wall strength will differ similarly the grain size is an important parameter in the metallic structure if the grain size are very very small then you will have a good strength so which is called as grain boundary strengthening uh, so it is a uh, it is a metallurgical phenomena just i'm highlighting the accept here uh, accept here so here the grains or finer at small, uh, some of the cases whereas it is bigger at uh, at some instant so what does it is conveying means the grain sizes are not same throughout the material uh, you are having smaller at one place and bigger as uh, some place so when we are taking this component for a loading the bigger grain region uh, will act as the uh, crack initiation region or it may be the failure region during service and one more thing you can say i can say that here the properties uh, along the direction is completely different so you could not expect isotropic material here okay so these are all the problems uh, based on the uh, the conventional available uh, additive manufacturing processes uh, so these conventional additive manufacturing processes are melting the material so this is comes under the category called fusion Uh, metal additive manufacturing process so in order to overcome such problem we should not melt a material so we are looking for a solid state uh, additive manufacturing process okay so as i told before uh, uh, in the introduction uh, part of my presentation uh, i am saying that uh, the welding process uh, is nothing but the additive manufacturing process and additive manufacturing process is nothing but the welding process so in order to know or in order to uh, get the knowledge on the additive manufacturing process you should know the knowledge of the welding process so uh, i'm going to now now onwards i'm going to explain about the solid state uh, additive manufacturing possibilities okay so i'm getting the idea uh, from the previous slides that the welding process can be used to for uh, the additive manufacturing process then there is a question why not we are you why not we could not use uh, why not we uh, we can use the uh, solid state uh, uh, welding process to the solid state additive manufacturing process there is com there comes an idea so in order to uh, talk about that we should first know about the uh, uh, the solid state welding process so friction based welding process is a solid state welding process because it does not melt the uh, material it will reach a temperature just below the melting point and it joins the material so uh, i think uh, some of you uh, well uh, well uh, 
uh, known about these kind of process, but uh, for the benefit of some of the undergraduate students, I'm just uh, explaining the basic phenomena over there, so they may get an understanding there. Okay, so here. Uh, the solid state welding process we are using is friction uh, stir welding process, which is the uh, figure shown first. And the second one is friction welding process. And the third one is rotary friction welding process. So these are the three uh, friction based welding process. So we are going to uh, take this friction welding process for the additive manufacturing. So the very first one is the friction stir. So how this is happening. So here you are having a rotating tool, which is highlighted in a blue color, which consists of two diameter uh, parts. The, the bigger diameter is the shoulder and the small diameter is the pin, which is uh, mentioned there over there. So it is allowed to rotate and it is allowed to plunge into the material until the solder surface touches the top surface of the plate. So on rubbing over there, it generates the heat. So, okay, you, you, you can feel the heat if you rub your hand. Okay, it's the same phenomena over there. Due to friction uh, between the rotating tool and the workpiece, there generates a heat which softens the material. And because of the stirring action, the material will flow from one side to another side and it is rotated around the pin and it is consolidated. Finally, you will get a, a, a complete joint. And coming to the second uh, process, it is called as linear friction process, whereas no, uh, no stirring action take place, uh, rather it is having only the rubber, uh, rubbing option. So here you can only do the sample which is having the square cross section or rectangular cross section. So here uh, uh, one of the sample uh, is allowed to bring uh, near to the another sample and allowed to rub in a pressurized condition and a final pressure is applied over there and a joining will take place. And, this, and the last third, uh, the last figure, you can find a rotary, uh, a rotary uh, friction-based technique uh, where one of the sample is allowed to rotate, uh, brings near to the uh, another sample, get contacted, rubbed over there, heat generated, and final pressure will be happened over there, and the joining happens. So uh, these are the three processes. Uh, I will show a demonstration of uh, the linear friction uh, process uh, in order to get more insight about that. Uh, this is the uh, project done in uh, the Welding Institute, uh, London. Uh, so here you can find how the friction is happening and the heat is generated and the joining takes place. So I'm just going to play this. So one of the sample is oscillating and bringing near to the another one. So it is get contacted now and the rubbing take place. The rubbing continues, thereby the heat generated. And because of the heat, the material is getting softened. You all know that if you heat a material, the material will get softer. So while making knife, while making sword, the metal is going to heat it and then you are applying a hammering. So why the material is heated? Because on heating, the material will soft. On applying force, it will get formed. So the it is happening here. The basic phenomena is based from there only. OK, so here uh, you can see there is no melting taken place. Only the material uh, is uh, heated to uh, uh, a temperature just below the melting point and the joining taken place. So this process is called the solid state process. Okay, so compared to the microstructure of the fusion based process, how the solid state process will look like. So in the very first uh, figure, you are seeing a, a microstructure uh, taken from uh, the processed region, which means uh, the rubbed region or the interface of the joining region. You can find uh, a finer grain size, uh, which are all equi-axis, because uh, equi-axis means it does not orient to any of the direction. Uh, so it is uh, equi-axis uh, grain size, and it is very finer. So because of this, as I told you earlier, uh, if the grain size is very small, you will get a grain boundary strengthen. So because of this process, we are getting a fine grains, thereby we are getting a grain boundary strengthening. So your component, what you are manufactured from this process 
there is a possibility uh, to get a, a product with good strength so you can compare with the uh, the the fusion based okay so you can also say that the property uh, across various directions may be the same because of the same grain sizes maybe some variation is there but it is not a, a tremendous one or it is not a significant one so in order to get these kind of beneficial properties we can use these welding processes for the additive manufacturing processes okay so there are three uh, variants of this friction based additive manufacturing process the first one is additive friction stir uh, process and an uh, additive friction stir deposition and additive friction deposition so we will see one by one so the first one is additive friction stir process so if there is a word stir is there so uh, stirring action is used to join the various uh, layers okay uh, so here you are using a solid tool this tool is a rigid tool it won't uh, consume it is a rigid tool so this rigid tool uh, is used for this process okay so the process is like this first we are using a layer one that is a plate a solid uh, rigid plate and you are placing a layer two plate over there and allow your pass over there so the these because of the stirring action the material will flow from layer 1 to 2 uh, and 2 to 1 so you are getting a joining between 1 and 2 and then you are adding an another plate over there and do a pass so which will uh, join to the previous two layers and layer 4 and you can successively add some more plates over there and finally you will get a, a block and there is a problem still uh, in this process even though it is in solid state it have its own challenges which is nothing but there is a hook formation so in the right side of the uh, so in the right side of this red line you uh, sorry left side of the right, uh, this red line you can find there is an upward flow this is a small crack like appearance which is called as hook form a uh, hook formation so this hook formation can be reduced by using uh, proper optimized process parameter uh, proper pin geometry so we can uh, we can reduce or we can even eliminate these kind of uh, shortcomings uh, by going for repeated trials so here the area of interest or area of usage is is highlighted in this red color block which can be extracted using machining and this samples can be taken for uh, uh, for further manufacturing or this may be a component so there is a material which is completely having the equivalent grain size uh, equivalent grains with finer size so this component is completely uh, 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 completely uh, defect free and this component uh, will provide a good strength will have a good strength and there is one more problem which is highlighted uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the previous slide there is a crack between layer of deposition so here in the figure in the bottom figure you can find there is a smooth transition which does not have any kind of crack this is also one of the big advantages of this process the next process uh, based on the friction uh, based welding process is friction additive friction stir deposition so what is the difference between the previous process and this process in the previous process we are using a rigid tool and here we are using a consumable tools consumable tool is nothing but while process it will consumes so here you are using a consumable rod it is allowed to uh, rotate and get touched over the substrate and it is allowed to rotate over there and it is drag so while dragging it leaves a material over there this phenomena is the, uh, represented here so the friction heat generated and it softens a region of uh, consumable rod so on dragging it will uh, deposit over there you can simply imagine you take a candle and draw uh, and drag over a floor so it le it leaves a layer of uh, wax wax over the uh, surface so the almost the same phenomena over there so it is also a solid state welding process a solid solid state additive manufacturing process so with this process you can you can do these kind of components so these are the components uh, fabricated with the use of this so this process is uh, adapted by nasa in order to uh, fabricate uh, these kinds of models 
which is uh, which is used for the space shuttles okay and it is also used in the aerospace you know aerospace, aerospace we are having a lot of structures uh, supporting structures will be there uh, for so so here you can find it was deposited over there in order to support the below uh, part even you can also do uh, the entire part with this uh, process so there is an another bursting will be there okay how uh, this friction uh, force uh, is enough or sufficient uh, for the material which are all uh, having very high melting point for example you can take an inconel material uh, the nickel based material or uh, uh, steel like uh, stainless steel you have to uh, you have to at least create a, a temperature of 1200 or 1000 to 300 degrees celsius Uh, in order to soft the material so that it will lay, lay a deposit over there so how can you do that so you need a support over there uh, in order to create more friction so in this first figure you can find the red color is the consumable rod along with that you are having a gray color part this gray color is a, is a is a rigid non consumable part uh, which is uh, placed there in order to get more friction because when you are using only the consumable rod you will have the contact area of the consumable rod but if you are adding some more area over rotating area over there so that you can increase the contact area so that the contact area increases you are getting more rubbing and uh, you can also uh, getting more cons uh, more consumed consumed part uh, part over there so that you can get a higher uh, deposited uh, the deposition Uh, with the thickness higher thickness so this can be also i'm i'm showing this just to prove that it can also be used for the material like steel inconel or titanium the third one is the additive friction deposition so this is a, a friction uh, based additive manufacturing process which is based on the rotary friction welding okay so the, in the rotary friction welding i explained us one of the sample is rotated and it is get rubbed and the material layer of material will be uh, uh, detached and attached to the another one so here uh, the same thing is there so see these are the each layer get detached from the other uh, component and it is get sticked to the other one substrate so you are deposited different layers there the number of layers and finally you can get a good uh, uh, good microstructured uh, components okay so in this figure you can find there is no cracks no porosity or any kind of voids and it is completely having the equax drain and the grains are very fine so this is a very good process where you are getting your you can overcome uh, many of the metallurgical related defects and getting a, a good um, good properties which is based on the completely the metallurgical aspects okay so these are the fundamental things so how can we take this process uh, to the industry because the industry needs various kind of uh, um, the cat uh, design categories okay so in order to design some of the things we are looking for different types of materials with higher strength higher ductility so if a material having higher strength it will have lower ductility so if a material having lower uh, higher ductility it will have the lower strength so we should have a material with higher strength and higher ductility so people are looking for various kinds of uh, uh, um, metallurgical uh, uh, strengthening processes or metallurgical strengthening uh, phenomenons in order to get higher strength materials okay so these process can be taken to accommodate that kind of needs okay the very first one is fabrication of in situ compo uh, composites so you can fabricate a composites during the process itself okay generally you can go for a stir casting or you need a separate process for making the composite here you you can do the additive manufacturing samples and the composite structures all together okay so how you can do that so here there is a consumable rod is there you can drill a hole and you can fill with the powders okay it may be a ceramic powder so so in my case i use aluminum rod and the reinforcement is the titanium powder okay so you can also use the metallic powder or based upon the need i used titanium powder because 
uh, you can reduce uh, the miscompatibility between the matrix and the reinforcement. So here the powder is filled and it is allowed to deposit. So what happened because of this stirring action or because of this rubbing action, uh, the powder will be mixed along with this matrix material and finally you will get a, uh, a composite. So, okay, so here you are finding a microstructure uh, which have a clear uh, 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 clear interface here, okay? Uh, but the interface is not having any kind of defects or cracks, okay? So you, it, there is a possibility in order to uh, uh, get a composite. And here uh, I have to also say that you can also use the stainless steel, okay? The Martin stick stainless steel is one of the uh, one of the high melting point uh, steel and it is very harder to. So even though there are some people uh, made attempt over their hard material and they can able to get 0.8 to 1.2 mm thickness for each deposition. For the aluminum, I got nearly one mm thickness for each cases. When we are going for powder, powder based techniques, you could not expect this kind of thickness because the powder layers will be in maybe in the micron size or it may be half millimeter, one millimeter, it's very difficult. Whereas when you are going for solid state uh, welding, uh, solid state additive manufacturing process, there is a possibility to get a higher deposition rate, which is very much uh, required for the industry point of view because the industry talks about only the time. They need only time, okay? so. With this deposition rate, you can reduce the fabrication time. Okay, so the second possibility for the industry. So the industry, based upon the requirements, in a lot of places, people are using foams. You know, there are a lot of foam sandwiches are used, especially uh, in the structures, in the civil structures, people are using that. Uh, in some of the uh, small size bridges, people are using the uh, foam sandwiches. So this additive manufacturing process can be used to for uh, this foam sandwich making, okay? So first, you all know about what is foams, okay? Uh, foams, it, it have a, a, a vacancy uh, in, between, uh, in between the boundary walls, okay? Uh, it is like a cellular structures randomly oriented over there. So this is the foam structure which you are seeing, uh, seeing here. And you are having a plate in the bottom and plate in the top. It is very difficult to fabricate these kind of things using a conventional one. Okay, so there is a possibility of uh, adapting this additive manufacturing process over there. Okay, so here you are using a rigid uh, tool and it is passed over in this trajectories so that there is a bonding between the sandwich product with the uh, the top plate or the bottom plate can be achieved and in the you can see that in the figure c the interaction between the foam and the material it's very clear and it is defect free there is no crack uh, or there is no vacancy over there so it is completely get uh, bonded and the bonded is a metallurgical bond that is a very important thing Okay, the next one is ordered metallic foams. So what is ordered metallic foams? So in the previous cases, the cell structures are randomly oriented. It have a different cell thicknesses or cell wall thickness and it uh, the cell area or cell volume is also different. Then there is an another category. It is the cell wall is the same throughout and cell area is cell volume is same throughout the structure. So that is called as the ordered metallic forms. So one well-known ordered metallic form is the honeycomb structures. You all know that. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, highly wanted in the uh, automobile structures because it have the uh, it is a weight saving structure. Uh, then it can uh, reduce uh, the vibrations uh, it can decay the vibration. So a lot of, uh, lot of uh, advantages are there for this structure. So there is a possibility uh, for adapting these uh, techniques to make this structure also. So in this figure, you can find you are having a consumable tool that is the blue color and there is a support uh, rigid uh, tool and you, are, you can deposit 
along these trajectories so that you are getting a honeycomb structure and the next one is the fabrication of oxytic material maybe uh, i don't know some of you uh, may not know about this oxytic material so let me introduce that oxytic material so oxytic materials it's not a material based on its metallurgical aspects so oxytic material is a material based on its geometrical aspects okay so the conventional available materials are the uh, and uh, non oxidic type which is the positive negative uh, positive poisson ratio will be there but for the oxidic material there will be a negative poisson ratio so what is that so the poisson ratio it's depended based upon its uh, expansion and contraction mechanism so in the conventional material if you expand a material or if you pull a material uh, the cross sectional area will uh, will reduce and if you compress a material and it will get expand so this is the phenomena of phenomena of uh, deformation uh, in the conventional material whereas in the oxidic material if you pull it will expand if you push it will contract okay so uh, i will show you a okay so when i am pulling this this region has to be reduced but this is expanding and when i am compressing it has to be expand but it is reducing so this is the behavior of oxidic material okay so just an introduction about oxidic material so we can use this additive manufacturing process for making this complex shapes uh, which are all the oxidic type okay so in this figure i am uh, in this video i am going to show the demonstration of loading of material where you can see that so in conventional when you are compressing a material it will go for a bulging whereas here it is going for a contraction okay see instead of bulging it is going to contract so you are getting a negative poisson ratio so we can use this kind of uh, additive manufacturing process to make this kind of different uh, arrangement of cell structures and different arrangement of uh, this kind of cell walls okay there is an potential application of this material uh, in the uh, ballistic application so ballistic is nothing but like uh, resistance to bullet penetration okay uh, for your understanding i'm saying so here you can see that there is a comparison between oxidic material and non oxidic material so in the oxidic material when a bullet hit over there in the one wall the another wall does not have the deformation because uh it came with an energy and it get decayed here because of this geometric uh, arrangement and when we are using a solid material there or a non uh, oxidic material there if the same uh, bullet is penetrated here it create a, a, a maximum deformation which may uh, injure a, injure a soldier or a person inside this kind of vehicles so this is also a potential applications uh, in the drd use okay so he, here some of the uh, graphical plot how uh, uh, the force decay is happening here how the displacement is reduced okay the solid line is the uh, non oxidic material and the dotted lines are the oxidic material okay uh, to be say, uh, to be noted here in the figure c you can find the solid have a higher force uh, reaction force whereas uh, the dotted lines have is a very uh, lower reaction force so by reducing this reaction force we can reduce the damages in the persons inside this vehicle okay so then the next possibility of using this process is fabrication of functionally graded materials okay so we all know that uh, the okay so first we have to know that what is meant by functionally graded material so graded is not is meaning that gradient gradient is changing with respect to distance okay 
So there is a component at the one end, it is having a material one, and at the another end, it is having a material two, and in between, there is a gradient zone. Okay, so for example, here a hundred percentage of material one is there. For example, uh, we, we can say that material one is aluminium and material two is steel. So in the material one, we are having hundred percentage of aluminium, and here ninety nine percent, it's ninety eighty percentage of aluminium, fifty percentage of aluminium, uh, forty thirty twenty ten, then hundred percentage of steel. Okay, so this is called as the functionally graded material. this kind of material arrangement is highly required uh, in various applications to be specific uh, the in the gas turbine engines there are there is a possibility of uh, two materials uh, bringing together near to the engine one is the inconel another one is the titanium so the inconel has to be near to the uh, the higher temperature region uh, and uh, the titanium has to be followed that uh, inconel so there is a gradient of material should be there so that uh, we can uh, meet our uh, requirement in the aero engines okay so what uh, what is the challenges in this okay so if you are using material 1 as aluminium and material 2 as steel you are having a different uh, crystal structure atomic arrangements all the things okay uh, hardness uh, latent heat and everything so you are you are going to combine or you are going to uh, join two materials uh, to, which are totally incompatible you know so it is very difficult for a fusion uh, a fusion based additive manufacturing process so in the figure uh, the second figure you can uh, you can see that there is a material one that is uh, the 304 stainless steel and another material is inconel 625 you can see that there is a continuous crack between these two material so it is very difficult and here the process uses direct energy deposition it is one of the fusion based uh, which involves melting and another one is it is a laser based uh, material here also you are having titanium and another one is the stainless steel so while joining or while uh, combining these two material you are having a cracks and even you are also having a micro cracks between the interfaces so when you are using the fusion process it is very difficult but when we are using a solid state material it is it is possible so this is just an idea uh, which may trigger you to do some more research over there because there is no papers available on this aspects okay so finally the anticipated benefits when you are using this process what are the benefits we may get the first one is uh, refined grains which was discussed and we may get uh, an equest grains Uh, so that you will get an isotropic property because of the uh, uh, equest grains you will get uh, same properties along different directions okay and there is a possibility of doing functionally graded materials and we can also uh, join dissimilar material combinations and non fusion weldable material there are some materials which cannot be uh, which cannot be uh, welded properly okay one one such material is aluminium if you are welding welded aluminium using tig or mig you have lot of challenges okay so that is one of the uh, non fusion weldable materials however some people are getting uh, some good property over there using different filler materials optimization but generally speaking it is a non fusion weldable material so okay so you can do uh, the additive manufacturing of that samples also then low elemental segregation it is an uh, it is related to casting or it is related to uh, welding you may aware about that and no aggregation of oxide particles this is also a problem of melting of material low residual stress so because of uh, this localized melting of material uh, which which will creates uh, the inducement of residual stress over there uh, and in the fusion welding process you are not going for very high uh, temperature so that the amount of heat in that experienced by the material is very low so that you can get a lower residual stress then no porosity because you don't have melting and there is no entrapment of gas over there so no porosity and no hot cracking it is a solidification related effect and high build rate as i told in one of the slide you can achieve a, a, 
a thickness of nearly 1 mm for each layers so you can get a high build rate and large scale products and potential uh, to make the in situ composites okay so this summarize various benefits uh, uh, so that this process can be fit for the industrial need okay so what are the challenges generally if if some someone is talking about a process they will only hail about the process and they won't highlight the negatives okay but here it has to be highlight the negatives because it have lot of negative points so that still it is in research and it is not in the industry so we have to reduce the negative points uh, uh, so that it will uh, we can take this process to the industry okay the first one is part distortion due to high axial force as i depicted in the basic uh, principle of operation uh, it involves in uh, compressing compressing the sample okay so that you will deposit a material over there so because of the uh, compression of one layer the previous deposited layer may have some kind of deformation okay so this is one of the uh, one of the shortcoming of these processes the second one is the part complexity so it it is going to deposit so the machine has to be access over the sample or over the layer in order to uh, in order to lay the another layer so the very complex geometries cannot be done by using this additive uh, friction deposition there is a possibility of doing that by including a, uh, a robot over there in order to support uh, support this deposition so we can reduce by including the robot so it is a solution for that however it remains a, a challenge over there the next one is dedicated uh, fixturing might be required because if you are going uh, a bit complex shaped in order to support the actual actual axial uh, pressure or pressure created over there with the use of the um, uh, with the use of the tool uh, we need a proper fixturing we need a support structure which give, uh, which has to be uh, provide a proper support or else you will have a deformation in the sample which we are producing the next one is the machine of course it requires a, uh, a machining process because the surface finish will be poor for this kind of process because it is layering a one mm thickness and another one mm thickness so of course there will be a differences or some gap will be there so it has to be removed by using the machining process okay so okay there are two types of machining the first one is the machining uh, during the layer for example you are added a layer and you have to uh, machine over there so that that added layer will be smooth and it will be prepared for the next successive layer so this is one type of machining and the second type of machining required is final uh, end product okay so you are giving good surface uh, finish for the product so two two possibility of machining uh, is required for this so these are the some of the challenges over there so let me come to my uh, conclusion uh, the friction based additive process have uh, potential for various fields which i discussed uh, like composites making uh, foam structures then um, honeycomb structures then gradient functional graded material so so you are having lot of uh, uh, scopes over there and uh, coming to its benefits it have a desired microstructure so that you will get a better strength so whatever the strength of the material you are uh, you are getting it is completely based upon the microstructure of the material so you are getting a good microstructure so automatically you are getting a good strength and then most wanted for the industry it have a high deposition rate so that you can uh, make a large scale products at low cost so this is my conclusion and thank you i i invite the people to give uh, feedback and uh, i'm willing to answer for, for some of your questions uh, 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 good afternoon sir and uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation so um yeah so can we somehow deposit sandwich structure of uh, titanium and aluminum layers if yes what is the minimum thickness of each layer that can be possible okay uh, so the sandwich sandwich of aluminum and titanium yes yes sir 
okay so there are a lot of possibility uh, the very first one is i suggest uh, i suggest you to go for this process which you are seeing i think you are seeing the screen are you seeing the screen uh, now the sharing is not okay okay so this process i think it is suitable for making that uh, coming to uh, the thickness uh, the aluminium can be uh, the higher thick one and the titanium can be the lower one uh, because the titanium is the harder material uh, it is very difficult to uh, uh, soft the uh, make the material to soft and flow around the materials so you can use uh, for when you are using the aluminium you can go for higher thickness and uh, you can uh, while go for the titanium you can go for lower thickness so i could not right now i could not uh, point a, a figure a number to you because it's completely depend upon uh, the tool dimensions what you are using the pin length what you are using the tool material what you are using so it completely depends upon that so you need a multiple trial over there uh, to see uh, Uh, how the material is flow for titanium uh, but uh, for aluminium i am very sure that you can uh, use uh, maximum of like uh, 15 mm thickness because i was personally um, experienced on uh, doing welding on 19 mm thickness so for this case you can use uh, to maximum of around 15 mm for titanium i'm not sure we should do some trials in order to uh, see that professor so, sabri the question was uh, no how to make an honeycomb type structure using various materials oh sorry 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 honeycomb side uh, structure yeah. which one is the cell material sorry sorry i'm talking okay i'm talking i'm thinking in terms of sandwich okay okay okay, okay sorry sorry Uh, what is what is the cell material? Which one is the cell? Aluminium is the cell or titanium is the cell? So uh, foam structure. The, uh, it has not been mentioned, but you can take anything and just explain us. Uh, ah, okay. So if uh, the titanium is in the center, I think uh, the titanium must be the center because titanium is very heavier than the aluminium. So foam structure, we are going for weight saving purpose. so the titanium must be the i think uh, to the maximum the titanium must be the uh, foam structure and the aluminium may be the uh, the plate okay so you can do a plate thickness of uh, 15 mm okay and uh, the compactibility between aluminium and titanium uh, is good because uh, some of my friends they did uh, uh, the friction welding of aluminium and titanium and they good, they get a Uh, good joint strength and uh, when you are uh, joining two material the interface is a critical region because it 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 will have a, uh, a different uh, microstructure called uh, uh, intermetallics so when you are using the solid state process you can, there is a possibility to reduce the intermetallics uh, between uh, these two layers so uh, it is possible the uh, the thickness of the plate for aluminium is 15 i think more than more than 15 can also be there there what about for similar for honeycomb structure if we wanted to combine what uh, can uh for the honeycomb structure uh uh so it it, it is a combination of dissimilar or you are talking about only one material Alum, aluminium com, uh, honeycomb structure and uh, uh, titanium honeycomb structure or it is a combination of both combination of both combination of both okay so for that uh, you have to go for different process parameters first thing uh, while using the aluminium uh, the diameter of this rod may be a different uh, because it have a higher deposition rate whereas when we are going for titanium uh, the diameter of the tool will be different uh, and it is a highly uh, challenging one because when we are using aluminium for example if you are using aluminium at the bottom and you are lay, laying a layer of titanium over aluminium so it may 
uh, it may deform uh, the structure which was previously made using aluminium so it is better to have uh, titanium for, uh, first and aluminium uh, next uh, so the the process parameter uh, the consumable tool diameter entirely it will different for differ, uh, both material because the physical properties of these two materials are different so I, I can say it is everything is in a laboratory level for the special cases of course you need a lot of trials you know yes sir yes next question then uh, yes sir so the the question is can we process high melting point materials of course i highlighted in one of the slide okay so in the 1996 itself uh, a person who uh, used martan stick stainless steel and he achieved a thickness deposition thickness of 0.8 to 1.2 so it is uh, highly possible okay so even uh, I, I i answered for the previous uh, question there is a possibility of uh, depositing uh, titanium so of course it is possible okay so so one last question uh, what yep. was the, what is the material used for that rigid uh, uh, structure used for steering uh sorry can you come again uh, the the rigid uh, material that is used for steering oh so you are asking about the tool material yes sir okay so it depends upon the uh, it depends upon the uh, the material what you are going to steer okay for example if you are using the aluminum as the base material the work piece then uh, the tool steel is enough okay and if you are uh, using a high strength aluminum for example 7075 okay so uh, grade aluminum uh, the tungsten carbide tool is much enough for the steel you can use tungsten carbide steel that is enough so for this rigid tool you can uh, use uh, there are a polycarbonate tool is there uh, tungsten based lot of tools are there so these are the some of the common tool materials okay which is very much related to the cutting tools cutting tools for uh, milling lathe you can use the same tool for this uh, tool the only uh, only requirement is the tool has to be rigid even at the high temperature that is the only requirement so you can use these are these are the common materials which i highlighted okay sir so uh, thank you sir that is all that was all the questions now uh, Reynolds sir will take over from here. Yeah. Uh, Professor Sabri, you know, really that was a very good session. It was, uh, you know, the topic AM is generally misinterpreted as 3D printing. Generally, that is how you know, everyone takes it. Now, many engineers, you know, even they, they think R&D manufacturing and 3D printing are really same. So this session will fix the difference in the perspective. So I really thank you for that. And uh, also the discussion on the asymptotic material, that is the negative poison ratio material and that demo would have created new interest uh, on our participants because it is also one of the new field that is uh, growing on. Also the work on FGM gave a good idea so for researchers like us so we will be able to explore uh, you know, these uh, works and uh, additive manufacturing of metallic component and the challenges you know it gives and whatever you have highlighted was a very good uh, uh, it, was, it was highlighted in a very wonderful manner and always if there is an issue uh, we have a problem statement and then as engineers we have our jobs so really thanks for highlighting all the issues and other things and this session was really wonderful and we had very good participations from our participants there were a lot of questions in between we were answering all those questions really thank you we appreciate you know for you coming and giving this presentation and thanks for uh, sharing your knowledge thank you sir yeah thank you and uh, sorry uh, for Not some of the entirely. some of the participants uh, who they really raised a good questions yeah uh, i am i'm reading now when you are talking uh, so uh, but uh, because of the time constraint i think uh, i can i'm able to give some of the answers only uh, sorry for the questions and uh, we really thank you and all the questions the other participants asked the answers are available in the uh, literatures i uh, no, i encourage them to go and uh, you know to dig the literatures and find all those answers 
and participants thank you for your uh, uh, presence and we'll start the next session by 2:30 oh, no we, we request you to, to join by some 10 to 5 minutes before uh, thank you once again everyone thank you sir thank you thank you bye